Okay, so you didn't have enough of uh, mass cytometry and single cell analysis. Uh, uh, like, I'll continue that topic. But I hope that um, the approach I'm going to be describing and the choices that we made to make this work will be useful to people that are doing causal discovery in many other domains. So um, I'll repeat uh, a little bit about the measuring te technology just very quickly so that you uh, learn it better. This is the machine just shown before from a different angle. Uh, we can measure, <coughs> so and it can do single cell measurements. Uh, let me give you an example why I think it's uh, very important. Uh, so try to imagine that you're trying to do causal discovery with, um, say, to discover that um, Average, uh, that consumption of milk uh, reduces chances of osteoporosis, all right? But instead of measuring uh, millions of people individually, you measure the average uh, consumption of milk in, a, uh, in 10 countries and the average prevalence of osteoporosis. So it would, a lot of things can go wrong when you uh, average out. And these machines can measure uh, at an astonishing rate of 10,000 cells per second. So we end up with like collections of data that range in the millions. So I mean, I'm very excited that uh, there are publicly available data about this and allow us to uh, do causal discovery. On the downside, we can only measure up to 30 proteins at a time, but hopefully we'll have smart algorithms and we can um, piece together data sets that measure 30 proteins at a time, but different proteins at the, at the time. The applications of this, I mean, you saw some in the previous um, uh, talk, is cell counting, like counting how many cells are uh, alive or dead. Uh, cell sorting, also called gating, so we split cells to different populations. Uh, identify signaling responses, drug screening, and hopefully, uh, with the methods I'm going to show and other methods, uh, we can do causal discovery uh, de novo. And why not personalized causal discovery for a given patient or a disease-specific causal discovery for a given disease, find the dysregulations. Uh, in one slide, uh, we label, I mean, not us, but you know, people who do this, uh, label uh, with antibodies the proteins. They have synthesized the antibodies with rare isotopes that don't occur in uh, nature, in human body. Uh, then it goes through cell by cell to the machine, and their mass spectrum is measured. So you can identify how many copies you have of, of these um, rare antibodies, and hence the protein. And then we come down to a nice uh, two-dimensional matrix that we all know and love. OK, and <clears throat> now we're going to study cells of the immune sy uh, system in the blood. Um, and this can be distinguished, as uh, shown before, by specific markers on the surface in a process that resembles a decision tree. So uh, they start like uh, partitioning, partitioning uh, the cells until they reach uh, a leaf where you say, well, this group of cells is a natural killer uh, cells, and this group is uh, T cells and so forth. So we'll have different uh, cell subpopulations. Uh, the way people use this to identify signaling responses is, uh, first of all, the um, proteins may stay inactive until you activate them with a signal, okay? Uh, uh, with a signal that comes from an activator. And uh, the signal responses are subpopulation specific. Some cells respond, some cells don't, uh, depending on their type, on their cell type. So the procedure is to also uh, label functional proteins inside the cell, in this case PSAT3 and PSAT5, this example. Uh, and then activators are applied to stimulate a response. These are different activators. Then we gate the cells, and then we measure the protein abundance. So you can have for each activator and each subpopulation, uh, you can see the difference between the unstimulated and stimulated response. Okay. And <clears throat> now, in many diseases like auto-inflammatory disease, uh, auto-immune diseases, inflammatory diseases, the immune system responds uh, when it shouldn't. So we, we want to develop drugs that inhibit this response. And uh, in order to, to screen drugs that actually inhibit this response, first uh, they stimulate with the activators the cells. And then they put the potential uh, inhibitors uh, in, the, in the sample. 
So then uh, you sort the gate uh, again by subpopulations, and you can get these curves where you see uh, the dose uh, response curves for a given inhibitor uh, and a given subpopulation and a given activation. OK, so that, that's very briefly the technology. Now, about the public data available, uh, and hopefully you know, other people uh, will analyze them too in a causal manner. Um, so in uh, the Bental data set, as, as we call it, uh, in 2011, uh, one human donor uh, was uh, measured with uh, 13 surface being labeled and 18 functional variables. And we, in no activation conditions and in 13 uh, activation conditions. And this was repeated uh, for a se second donor. Okay, this is relatively simple, but the next year, uh, they, in um, um, Bowden Miller uh, publication, they introduced this uh, multiplexing technology. This is uh, a plate with 96, uh, 96 wells. And in each well, they put cells coming from a different experimental condition. So here, they vary the timing of the measurements. And here, they're varying the activation conditions plus the no activator. So you have all combinations of different times and activation conditions. And then each one of these gives you um, a data set for all uh, cell populations. In a second plate, a uh, second experiment, they vary the activation conditions and different human donors. So again, you have like um, data sets coming from these conditions on different donors. And in a, in a third plate, they have a, an inhibitor, and they vary the dosage of the inhibitor and the activation conditions. But in fact, they actually do this for 27 different inhibitors. OK. Um, nice slide. Pardon me? Nice slide. <laughs> yes, thank you. So we end up with data uh, that, I th if, I'm, if, I'm not cor if I'm correct, they have more than 150 million single cell measurements. So we can now do causal discovery, hopefully. <laughs> All right. So this is a, a one data summary. Uh, it's not a full factorial design. So they have, um, if you take this column, for example, we measure, they measure all activators for a given a specific time point, uh, which is 30 minutes after activation, uh, for a given donor, for all inhibitors, and then they measure all subpopulation, all proteins. Uh, OK. Here's another uh, summary of the data, another way to see that. Here we have the union of the proteins, uh, the union of the variables measured in both uh, collections of data. And here we have the union of the experimental conditions, if you like, of the activators varied. Uh, so you see that some of the variables are measured by both authors in uh, a subset of uh, experimental conditions. Some are measured uh, by neither author, and some are measured by one author and, uh, or the other. Okay. So this is one way to see the data. OK, so we want to do causal discovery from that, um, this type of data. And we know everything that can go wrong probably will. Do we have like feedback loops? Yes. Do we have latent variables? You bet. Uh, Nonlinear relationships, unfaithfulness. OK, so uh, what we try to do is consider a basic approach, in fact, the most basic approach, the simplest approach that relies on the fewest, most basic assumptions of causal discovery. OK, and if this doesn't work, um, then there's no point like uh, doing something more fancy or sophisticated, perhaps. And this approach has to do with local causal discovery, which, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, first discovered and, and articulated by Professor Cooper. Um, so here, we don't try to learn a network. Uh, this is uh, kind of similar direction with uh, Matt Howe's uh, work. OK. Um, so we, we, we don't try to learn a network because uh, a, uh, useful information propagates to orient edges but also errors propagate. The, the chances when you try to learn a network that you're going to do something wrong and it's going to mess up like uh, your results somewhere else, I think, are pretty high. 
So we're looking only at triplets of variables, x, y, and z, triplets. And let's say we have uh, one triplet where there's only a single independence, conditional independence, and everything else is dependent. Okay, all other dependencies are there. So what, can, what are the possible models uh, that can explain this? And here are all the possible models. Now, these are uh, semi-Markov causal networks, meaning that we also explicitly have uh, uh, um, representing the latent confounding uh, variables. So you could have uh, uh, latent confounders and also direct causation that's allowed. Uh, but they assume uh, that you have a recursive uh, model that, that there are no feedback cycles. Now, let's assume that nothing causes X, that we get this uh, piece of uh, information. And the only model that is consistent with both this, uh, with both the data and the knowledge is this one. X causes Y causes Z. So the effect of X to Z is mediated by Y. Also, in statistics, there's mediation analysis but they, uh, f for this type of uh, reasoning, but they don't do search, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Okay, so are there cases where this, uh, we do have information like this? And yes, there are. We can use the activator, the stimulus condition, as our instrumental binary variable. It can be on or off, and this is determined purely by the um, experimenter. Yes. Uh, a model, there's no X. No, you check all dependencies. Okay, this is the only independence out of all possibility. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so um, then we can make a new discovery that Y causes Z. That's our new <coughs> postulate. Y causes Z. Now, if you think about what are the, the fundamental uh, assumptions, is the causal Markov condition is Reichenbach's common cause principle, which is a limited version of faithfulness, if you'd like, and that you don't have feedback cycles. And I would argue that even if you do have feedback cycles, uh, this should work okay in, in the sense that uh, you may have like some associations disappear, for example, due to negative feedback loops, but you're not gonna make the wrong um, um, you're not going to postulate the wrong uh, causal relationship. You're just going to uh, have some false negatives, so just miss some relationships. Okay, but in order to make this work, you know, it's, it's still not trivial. So uh, here are the issues that we faced and our decisions. Issue number one, signaling is subpopulation specific. So you only see some causal relationships uh, under specific signal. So the way we deal with that is to analyze subpopulations independently. We don't share uh, reasoning between different subpopulations in a way. Now, the different subpopulations measured in the Bowden-Miller data are these ones, and in the Bedell are these ones, and there are only three that we could identify as being the same, CD4+, plus, CD8+, plus, and natural killer cells. And this population, uh, CD4+, four plus is actually split to two in the Bendel data. Okay, issue number two. Relationships are not linear. You may have a relationship appear only uh, um, in specific conditions. Okay, so um, for example, uh, you may see a causal relationship only when they, there is activation. So we pull together the unstimulated and stimulate data uh, for an activator. And also, you may have like uh, latent confounding variables appear under different activators. So one activator may not activate a latent variable, and another one may, may do so. So you're, you'll see the triplet in the first one, but not in the second one. So uh, in order to avoid these situations, we analyze data from different activators independently. So independently for each subpopulation, independently for each activator. Issue number three, uh, we can, you know, we assume in causal discovery we have this type of test, but in practice it makes a big difference. So we need to check dependencies and independencies, and we need to choose a test. In this case, we have one binary variable, two continuous variables. Um, so here are the things that we tried. We tried discretization with Hartemix methods, uh, equal binning, equal frequency, 
Um, but nothing seemed to work right. Uh, and when I say nothing seemed to work right, even if you do uh, some simple simulations, uh, the independencies didn't seem to be preserved. We didn't like that. So we moved on to uh, maximum information coefficients approach, published recently in Science. Uh, there are several problems with this one uh, to apply it, uh, in this setting. But also, it's not conditional. It needs to be extended. We tried the kernel-based conditional independence test, gives similar results to the linear test, so we dropped it. Uh, and ended up, unfortunately, with the simplest um, test that we could think of, which is the Fisher Z test, uh, assumes linearity and normality. And whenever the test involved a binary variable, uh, we use a test based on logistic regression. Issue number four, we really, uh, we would like to experiment uh, and, and validate any findings. I, 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 uh, I'm going to go to the biologist and say, try this experiment. So I really want to make sure the experiments they're going to do uh, will work, have a good chance. So I would like to be as robust and conservative as possible. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, idea number one. We don't check the minimal number of dependencies and independencies. We check all dependencies and independencies. There are six of them. So if you assume faithfulness, you can entail this structure uh, by the first four. But if the structure is true, this one should also hold. OK? So if you want to be robust, you also check these ones. And if they don't hold, then something is wrong, maybe a violation of faithfulness. OK? So you're on the conservative side. Second idea to be robust. You, we use two thresholds for the uh, dependencies to decide dependencies and dependencies. One threshold to accept dependence. If it's our p-value is too low, we accept dependence. If our p-value is too high, we accept independence. In the meantime, in, the, in between, we don't know. We don't make a call. Okay, and so we use extreme p-values, not like uh, in the middle part. Issue number five. So if you if you take the uh, different plates uh, that correspond to different inhibitors, they all contain a row here which is independent of the inhibitor. It's for zero dosage. So. Uh, Essentially, this well in each of these plates corresponds to zero dosage and no activation. So they should all have the same distribution. It's like we're repeating the same experiment, the same measurement, 27 times. And similarly, this well, this well with the corresponding column here. Okay, they should all have the same distribution. Well, do they? That's a question. Uh, this is like an, an internal quality checking of the data. So. We defined uh, a distance between two plates by checking how similar the corresponding uh, distributions are for each activator. And then we cluster. And uh, here's what we find. Here's what we find. So there are three, there are naturally occurring groups of plates. Okay, and that means to us, and, and between groups, the distance is, is quite high. Uh, in a sense. So that means there was not um, full reproducibility of the experiments. There may be batch effects. Maybe there was a little um, more, um, um, the samples were a little different or measured at a little, little uh, different time. I, I don't know why. Uh, the machine may be uh, not being calibrated uh, the same. But, but we don't expect like um, to find cause their relationships 100% uh, in all of them, OK? So overall, this is our pipeline for making predictions. So for each triplet where S is a stimulus or an activator, if you'd like, and uh, we have two proteins, we pull together the data where we have no inhibition. We, we don't consider this data. And we have activation and no activation. And then we zero these counts. And we check whether P1 is actually activated, whether the, the activator actually works. Otherwise, we don't expect to see any relationship between these two. If it is, uh, we increase the counter. And then we check the six dependencies and independencies, and they should all hold uh, as expected. And if this is the case, 
If it's not the case, I mean, we, we, we don't have any findings. If, we, if it is the case, then our score, our confidence, the number of times that we've seen this triplet increases. And in the end, we have a score which is the percentage of times we find this triplet, we found P1 causing P2 out of the cases where P1 was actually activated. So th this is a standard uh, local cause of discovery, if you'd like. But we also have another check, which is, OK, now we go to time course data. And we are ready to postulate that P1 causes P2. Well, in the time course data, we better not see a situation where P2 is activated is, uh, before P1. If P1 is the one that's driving P2, then P2 shouldn't change before P1. If it is, we zero the score. The time course data is inconsistent with the um, cross-sectional data. And then we rank predictions by, by score. So let's see the results. We make around 300 predictions uh, with a score of more than uh, 40, uh, 50 percent. And as I said, uh, we expect not full reproducibility because of batch effects. And we make these predictions in 14 different subpopulations. I'm showing you here the top 10 predictions. And for some reason, 9 out of 10 top predictions involve the activator PVO4. Okay. These are uh, specific. Our predictions are specific for a subpopulation. And uh, there are, this is the score of the finding. So this one, we find all the dependencies and independencies uh, with extreme p-values in 87% of the cases where uh, PLC G2 was actually activated. So I think this is, uh, uh, should, um, um, uh, has a good possibility of actually being true. Um, OK. So how do we? validate this, well, we, we are planning experiments, but there's something we can do to have an internal validation. I think it's interesting. So let's see. Let's assume that we find these two triplets. Uh, and exactly what we're predicting is this small chain here of causation, and that no latent confounder uh, exists between any of these variables. Okay. So protein 1 mediates the activation, the causation between the activator and protein 2. Protein 3 mediates the activation between the activator and protein 2. And there are no latent confounders. So how can, what can we infer from that? What should we infer is that they should all be in a chain, right? They cannot be in parallel. They should be in a chain. So either this happens or this happens. So if our causal predictions are actually true, and you know, causal mark, uh, and our assumptions uh, actually hold in this domain. Uh, the, the, we we can also make these predictions, which means that we should also identify this or this triplet. Okay, so this triplet or this triplet should also appear in our results. Well, does it? And actually, it does pretty often. 42% of uh, whenever we have this case, whenever we have like two causes to the same protein, we also identify uh, a triplet, uh, either this triplet or this triplet, 42%. Despite the fact that we do ex uh, multiple tests, more tests than we should, and being strict on the thresholds. Uh, yes. The activator is binary, they're either yes or no? Yes, the, the activators are binary. OK, so this is an internal validation that, you know, if we're doing something, if, if the causal assumptions were not holding, I mean, you, you don't expect to see something like this. OK, the third, uh, <coughs> next is an external validation, a validation on the Bendel data. So on the Bendel data, we only have uh, three common subpopulations, CD8 uh, plus and CD4 plus and natural killer cells, and only a subset of the variables common. So we take the, the top uh, predictions with the top scores. And we would like to see if we can find the same in the Bendel data. OK, well, do we? Uh, the way we check is to run FCI with a standard threshold. We do several bootstraps for robustness. 
And then we count the times that we find conflicting structures by the FCI. Uh, we postulate P1 causes P2. Uh, and does it, how many times does FCI returns P2 causes P1? How many times does it return that actually, yes, P1 causes P2? And there's, there will be some cases where the FCI doesn't determine the orientation. So it's neither com uh, confirming or conflicting. And here are the, <clears throat> now mind you, the Bental data were taken uh, 15 minutes after activation. So that's a source of uh, a difference that uh, may uh, make this uh, fail. And here are the results. So let's go to the conflicting. Uh, in general, uh, very few bootstraps give us conflicting information, except, may, except this one. This is the worst uh, case. Uh, the rest one are, are relatively low. And there are cases where we do get a lot of confirming uh, information. So this one actually appears 50% of the time in the bootstraps. Now, let me also say that another possibility is that we have feedback cycles. So actually, correctly, we identify both um, um, FCI uh, finds both directions. OK. So <laughs> these are our results with the, this uh, fundamental approach. Um, What's the correlation between? The correlation is, OK, so this is the correlation as found in the Bendel data. This is the correlation as found in the Bowden Miller data. Between OK, the, the yeah, between. Okay. So uh, there, for the ones that are actually predicted confidently, I mean, it's <coughs> relatively uh, within you know, some statistical errors and some um, um, technical errors that you get from the measurings. <coughs> OK, so overall, um, we have hundreds of predictions that uh, we, we would like to test. Uh, hopefully, you know, with our collaborators in Karolinska, we'll uh, test some of them in the near uh, future. Uh, we do internal validation uh, that stems from non-trivial inferences, and it, it works relatively well. Um, and we have an external validation that also seems promising. Uh, but given the quality of the data, given that we don't, don't have full reproducibility, it's also expected. Uh, this validation is not to be fully reproducible. Ian, can you go back to the yes. previous slide for a second? I actually have a question about the correlation. Yes. So correlation means correlation between what? The P38 and stuff? Well, in, in this case, since you don't have, uh, you don't have a, a latent confounder, uh, the, the correlation is the causal effect, the direct causal effect. So but when you go down to correlation values that are really small, like one zero something. Where are they? Oh, sorry, this is a No, no, this is the, the conf uh, how many times you find conflict information. The correlations are on top of the edge. Okay, but and the here. correlation, you know, like, the, like interference between step 5 and step 70 at the bottom here. This one, 0 0.18. Yeah, yeah so that, that's a pretty small correlation. Yes. So your, your algorithm finds that it's very confident in that correlation. But it's still a really small correlation. I feel like. That is true, that is true, but uh, you may have, um, I mean, we, we have a lot of sample size, so you could be confident that this is, uh, you know. Smoking and monkey and smoking. Yes. Still very low correlation. That's yeah. true. But, okay. yeah. Okay. So, um, we do have evidence of batch effects and biological reasons for uh, or, or at least some other reasons, you know, that, that give this variability between uh, um, results that should be uh, the same. And as I said, uh, this method is really testing our most fundamental uh, principles, I think. Okay. So I'm now uh, moving on to the other extreme. The not-so-basic approach is actually the most complicated thing that uh, probably one of the most complicated things we've done in our lab. So um, now, in the data I described, we have different, uh, we, we measure the variables under different experimental conditions. And we measure different sets of variables, for example, between Bental and Bowden Miller. So, and we analyze them totally independent. We, we don't share inferences, OK? But ideally, you would like to co-analyze, integratively analyze all of this 
and, and get as much causal information as possible. So we would like to have algorithms that, uh, you know, find models that simultaneously fit under all, this, uh, all these data sets. Now, you cannot just be naive and pull everything together because they come from different distributions. They come from different experimental conditions, and they may be measuring different things. So we developed an algorithm to do uh, something like that. It's based on semi-Markov causal models, uh, where, just very briefly, x causes y uh, directly. And then you denote this with an edge. And you also have bidirectional edges to denote uh, latent confounding variables. And note that uh, you could have like both direct causation and latent confounders. OK. So this is the type of uh, formalism we're going to use. Now, what happens when you manipulate something? What happens is that, for example, if you manipulate B, uh, then all the incoming edges disappeared, right? So you do graph surgery before and after. OK, so these are the basic operations. And when we manipulate B in a structure S, we denote it like this. Now, how can we formulate the problem? It's a big inverse problem, where uh, if this is a true structure and you have a data set where you don't observe C, then you marginalize this structure over, uh, over C. And you, observe, uh, and you get some dependencies and independencies. If you marginalize E in, a, in another experiment, then uh, from the true graph, you get a graph where this is marginalized. And if you marginalize and do uh, experiments, then you also remove some edges. But of course, we don't know the true structure. We see all these dependencies and independencies. We know the conditions. Uh, for example, here we know that we manipulated C. Okay, and we try to find this graph so that when you marginalize and uh, do surgery, gives you this. When you marginalize and do surgery, gives you this, and so forth. OK, so it's a big inverse problem. And uh, we can see dependencies and independencies as constraint. Here's, a, here's an example. This is the stuff that Frederick was talking about in his uh, talk. Um, OK, so let's suppose we don't know anything about this structure, and we find that when we manipulate B, we find an independence. Right. So that means there cannot be any path from A to C that is M connecting when, um, when we remove any incoming edges to B. So the, what are the cases? Well, first of all, there, there cannot be any M connecting path when we remove edges to B. It means that A and C, the edge AC doesn't exist. This is one thing. But, and we should also break this path. So how can we break this path? Well, either A and B, either this edge doesn't exist, or if it does exist, here's a tricky point. If it does exist, it has to be into B. If it's into B, then it, it, it's removed when we do the surgery, when we um, manipulate B, right? And we break the path. Uh, or Similarly, this edge doesn't exist. If it does, it has to be into B. So you get a constraint like that, which looks a lot like a satisfiability constraint, like this one. So our proposition of variables is that there is an edge between A and C, uh, which, so we enforce that there is not an edge, and there is either not an edge between A and B, or the arrow is into B, and so forth. That's how we convert to satisfiability. OK. And, but if you do this, and we have done that, and you get a big uh, sad problem, and you try to resolve it, uh, most likely, in real situations, you'll find conflicts. So what do we do about statistical errors? Well, uh, the satisfiability instance becomes unsatisfiable, and you cannot get any information. So our solution is to have soft constraints to rank constraints according to confidence and start satisfying until we hit a conflict. And then we throw away the constraint that causes the conflict, and we continue. OK, that's, that's our approach. But what was tricky is how do you rank constraints according to confidence? 
All right, so confidence uh, constraints corresponds to dependencies and independencies. So in the previous uh, example that I just showed, you have an independency, and that gives you this constraint, right? So we need to rank dependencies and independencies. If we only had dependencies, the lower the p-value, the higher the confidence. If you have to rank only independencies, the, low, the higher the p-value, well, arguably, okay, the higher the p-value, the approximately, uh, the more away you are from dependence, okay? But how do you interleave the two? That, that's the question. So um, here's, here's what we did to do that. We need to compare p-values according to the confidence. So we form these two hypotheses. We form that the, p, the hypothesis that the p-value comes from a uniform distribution. So we're talking about an independence. A uniform uh, is also a beta 1-1. One, one. Or it could come from uh, an al the alternative distribution, meaning the distribution of p-values that correspond to dependencies. Uh, and we can capture this, this, we should see something like that. We can capture this with a distribution of beta xi comma one. And then what we observe is their mixture. Okay, we observe the mixture. Uh, this is the density of the mixture where P0 is the proportion coming from uh, the null hypothesis, the, the independence hypothesis. Okay, and we actually have a way, it's, it's here, but I'm not going to talk about it, uh, to estimate P0 and xi. So we have a, an estimation of our, um, that gives uh, the density uh, of this, uh, of our p-values. Now, how do we, how do, uh, how do we get so many p-values to estimate this? Well, when you run um, the algorithm, you do a lot of tests, and at some point you can stop and, and estimate this stuff, okay? So what we do then is uh, compute what's the, maximum a posteriori ratio that uh, the p-value comes from the null hypothesis over the uh, alternative or the dependent, the independence versus the dependence and also the reverse one coming from uh, dependence versus independence. And, and then we sort by the maximum. Okay, so you sort p-values like um, well, it comes um, um, uh, two times, I find two times more likely to come from an independence. And I find 1.5 uh, times more likely that it comes from an independence and, and so forth. And you start like, and you sort your constraints like that. So this is our, our uh, new approach. And we put all, all of this, uh, what I just discussed with a lot of other tricky details uh, into the combined algorithm it accepts a bunch of uh, data sets coming from different uh, distributions, measuring different uh, experimental conditions and variables. And it accepts them, does its reasoning, spits out <laughs> at the back a summary of semi Markov, all the semi Markov causal models that fit the data, uh, where you have solid edges when all semi Markov models agree the edge has to be there. Uh, missing edges when all the uh, models agree the edge is not there and dust edges otherwise. And um, also you could have like um, cases like this where there's a latent confounder plus a direct edge, right? Okay. Now I really, I also have to mention uh, Frederick's work uh, with uh, Dr. Houtin and uh, this summer that solves um, also the same problem published in UAI uh, differences is that it doesn't handle conflicts and it doesn't scale up so so well. We have a different way to represent the constraints. Okay. I have a question yet. Yes. So in some cases, in, in the data sets, specifically in mass spectrometry, um, sometimes you have a small number of cells, especially when you're doing with huge scale up the road. For a given population, you mean? Yeah, for a given actuator. So in your previous slide, is that going to is that going to be a problem because you can't get a significant p values when you're dealing with a much smaller, you're down to 100 cells or something. That's right. Is that going to cause a consistency problem in some kind or do you throw out those conditions? Well, hopefully, this p value, uh, which is not going to be very extreme, is going to be ranked low 
uh, in your sorted list of things to satisfy by conference, by conference. yes and it, 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 you can put it in the sad problem and give you erroneous information if it, if it doesn't conflict with anything else yeah, it's more likely to give you nothing. yeah but in any case, I mean, all, the, all these problems um, led me to try the very simple approach first. Okay, so this is kind of like the future where we want to go eventually, be robust and handle every, all the data, you know, and integratively uh, analyze and so forth. The other one is where we start. Yes. Okay, I'm almost done. All right. So the, we uh, tried a lot of simulated data where very quickly I'm just showing that the precision recall of the e on the edges and precision recall on the um, orientations are uh, relatively, I mean, they're relatively accurate. And also, as you increase the number of uh, data sets, you make more um, predictions. Uh, I mean, in, you find more invariant characteristics of, of your s equivalent set of models. But we also, I mean, that was our original um, um, motivation, was to try it on the mass cytometry data and be able to handle several data sets at once, not do independent analysis uh, of everything. So we, we took actually five uh, data sets from, from this uh, of mass cytometry, from the two collections of Boden, Miller, and Bendel. In uh, this data set, uh, this activator is our um, manipulated variable and so forth. In this, and also, this is a latent variable in this data set. So in this data set, uh, these three are not measured ever. Okay, and we can produce uh, jo um, these uh, graphs where we actually predict some edges between never jointly measured variables are missing or are there. So you can make interesting inferences like this. Okay, so this is the state of the algorithm. It's, it's complicated, but it can actually run on real data. So in summary, I personally believe that this is a, a great domain, mass cytometry, for uh, doing causal discovery. And we, with a simple approach, we can make, even with a simple approach, hundreds of robust causal postulates. Hopefully, if we have more uh, re, uh, data that are, uh, we can replicate better across uh, different trials, we can uh, be more confident. I advocate the following approach. Be conservative and be opportunistic. Uh, trying to learn big networks is, is very brittle. So uh, how, do we, how are we being conservative? We do local causal discovery. We perform uh, more tests than we should to test for violations of faithfulness. We do independent analysis of the populations. Uh, we are, are being opportunistic but, uh, you, by using two thresholds for independence and dependency, so we don't make certain uh, predictions that we could, perhaps, otherwise. Uh, we also have advanced algorithms that can handle different experimental conditions, overlapping variable sets, and deal with statistical errors. Hopefully, the trick to rank dependency and independence can be used in other algorithms, too. And we just scratch the surface. There's so much more to do with these uh, data sets and hopefully new data sets if you ever publish them. <laughs> okay, I cannot thank enough, uh, you know, my collaborators and the Karolinska team for really helping us understand the biology. Okay, um, so I'm, thank you very much. I'm ready to, came, uh, to take your questions. Yes? Uh, Great, I mean, especially the, the conflict resolving because uh, I can't wait to just plug that into our seat okay. as well and see whether, how well it works. Um, what I'm curious about is uh, the output of your procedure because you run, uh, I guess, something like FCI underneath? Yes, we run data. FCI for each data set and so then you take bugs and you you know, you reason with the bugs. So how am I supposed to interpret an edge in, given, given that tags give you ancestral relationships, right? How am I, how, what's the appropriate interpretation of an edge in this? Problem? Right, the bugs are an intermediary step in our procedure. The user, if you'd like, never sees that. The user enters the data sets and gets this, which corresponds to a summary of the semi-Markov causal networks. 
Okay, so this is the, the, the packs have disappeared now. In the output, uh, this corresponds to uh, a collection. It's a summary of a collection of semi-Markov. And the edges don't represent ancestry. The edges, the direct edges represent direct causation. And the bidirected edges, is there any? Yeah, the, the bidirected edges represent latent confounding. OK. So it is an actual direct edge in the it is an actual, underlying yes. graph. So yes. No longer the pyramid. Right. But, but the theory of maximal ancestral graphs is, you know, he, is used heavily I mean, to, to get this stuff. Yes? Why do you don't use full discovery rate when you run LCD? Because you have so many triplets of tests and they run in you know, the condition at once, so it's easy to do this adjustment on comparison to them. Sorry, uh, uh, use F, F false discovery rate to do what? control when you uh, run the LCD on all triplets. When you consider all the triplets. How can, how can you do that? I mean, you're, you're performing several tests yes. for each triplet. And some of the tests have to come out uh, high. You have to discover a deep an independence. So FDR is when you take a th you rank p values from, from low to high, and you take a threshold, and you make the calls. But here, you also have independences. You're making a call when you have something that's independent. It's fine. Just to be more conservative on the output because you have so many tests that you are doing in general. Yes. I'm not sure I fully understand you. But I don't think it's trivial to apply FDR here. Yes, positive. So you, a lot of key values would be smaller than alpha. By First of all, you want to do FDR on, on, on what exactly? The, the whole structure? Or the p values themselves in the algorithm used in the algorithm, used in the algorithm right. to call a triplet, R right? And globally, also overall triplets. Depends. I don't have a okay. I mean, I'm asking why you haven't considered this. Uh, because if you have a large data set, you may have. Millions of thousands of the triplets, and it's uh, and I like you know, the PCL grid that has internal FDR control. If you think about it by this condition, here have very similar tests that you run for this. It's, it's not. It's not similar. It's Can not I similar. Clarify, yes. Are there millions of triplets, or only the triplets involved activators? There are not millions of triplets. Uh, we have like. Yeah, uh, first of all, you have to have an activator in the triplet. So you have 11 plus 1. And, and you do several tests. And uh, so, so I, I think it's, and, and you have 27 repeats of the same experiment. So it's, it's, it's more complicated, I think. But, well, I'll say I mean, you kind of want to go for reporting all the things that might be of interest rather than eliminating them. I think you would err on that side. I would be tempted to cut out the low, the low correlations. I don't trust them, but your point is well Yes, so uh, yeah, one thing is, is we have the, the score, we rank by the score, which is how many times you find the triplet out of, uh, you know, total number of times you could. Um, but you could also rank as a second objective there with the, um, with, with the strength of the, co of the causal effect. Okay, that, that's certainly like uh, reasonable. Yes? I have a different question. So Sometimes I'm interested in um, what is the behavior under this activator. So let's say you fused here four activators. I see that you fused in here. It doesn't fuse four conditions. And I want to ask you, which of these connections do you see only under condition one? Yeah. Do you do that, or, or you might, they might get diluted out? You, you would have to check the, the probability tables here to see. Uh, I guess the structure is not going to give you that. You would have to okay. check and see that um, you know you have this causal effect only under this yeah. activation and not the other one. And then right. maybe you should just run it on just that one condition. Yes, yeah. if that's what you care about. You want some? Yes, friend. Um, I guess I have one more question. You said that your um, encoding is much simpler than the one uh, we yes. use. But, but, but that, that gives us like the, the difference in the, in the running times. But so your encoding has to be 
sufficiently representative so that, such that I could get an edge between every possible pair of variables, meaning the entire graph rather than an equivalence class. If I had enough experiments, I could recover uniquely the DAG, right? Well, uh, in reality, we don't start with a full, uh, with a fully connected uh, graph. We start with what FCI gives us. So um, that yes. already makes it uh, sparse enough to begin with. But how? If, the, if, if each edge in your output actually represents the presence of the edge in yes. the true graph, or the absence of an edge in the true graph, then the encoding has to somehow be able to represent each possible DAG over the set of variables, including each possible later right. variable. So, so, so I'm just curious how you can get a more efficient <laughs> encoding. We get more efficient encoding not from uh, encoding better the edges, by um, we, we have the same number of variables, I think. We work with inducing paths, and your algorithm works with uh, imposing one constraint for every uh, conditional subset. So you have one constraint for every uh, subset you condition on, uh, but we have one constraint per inducing, possible inducing path. That, that's that's uh, the, where you get the big difference. But I mean, I'll be happy to talk about it in detail. Um, yeah. Yes. Just a couple more kind of questions. You mentioned that the conditional independence test in case of non-independence. And my comment is that uh, there is a procedure uh, developed by the late econometrician uh, Hal White, which uh, tests the conditional independence using uh, uh, elegant distance between the uh, factorization of the joint uh, margin and the joint probability uh, space function and uh, exploiting a bootstrap procedure that basically exploits uh, the distribution of p-value that we have shown at a certain point. And uh, I have done some simulation that it actually works well until uh, two conditions variables. So we could use it. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. There, okay. Let me say there there are alternatives to the condition dependence test, but we didn't want to solve uh, the problem of conditional independence testing before we move on. So we just tried several things that seemed reasonable out of the box. They didn't work out of the box, so we we took what was working, even though it's linear. But I mean, this is certainly something to to try here. Yes? I had a question about your uh, time series filter earlier on. Ah, uh, yes. So you filter out, um, no. right, if the second protein is activated before the first protein, you filter it out. Yes. But does that filter out uh, cases when there are two different proteins that activate the second protein? You could imagine, because uh, you use that in your internal validation, like the fact that two different proteins could activate. Third. And it seems like uh, like one protein would be activating it, and the other protein would not be involved. And you might figure that out in this filter. Um. Yes. Uh, okay. I, I have not thought um, thought about the internal validation here. So. I, I mean, we. Pre I, I'm not sure I understand the question fully, but. In general, you, you make this prediction, so you better find that protein 3 is activated at or after, uh, sorry, uh, before or at the time point that protein 1 is activated, and protein 1 is activated at or before protein 2 is activated. If you find something different, it's inconsistent and we throw it away. What if you have a V structure? You have A. You, we don't have V structures here. Oh, okay. We, we, we only have, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, chains. Yeah. Right? Okay, I'll, I'll be glad like, if this is the last question. Okay. I'll, I'll be glad to take your questions offline now. And uh, your feedback and you know, suggestions are uh, very welcome. Okay? So, thank you. Thank you.